this figure is a disgusting state of the world in which the Saudi Arabian government is able to maintain its power through the oil wealth that is contributed by Western contractors coming in and making the siphoning and refining of that oil easier. It is a disgusting state of the world when the Arab Spring is able to be continuously oppressed by consultants from companies like Blackwater that go in and train their militaries in order to prevent the will of the people from coming in. What we're going to bring you from open government is a case that states that those individuals owe a moral duty to prevent the proper functioning of that repression and that lack of accountability. What I'm going to bring you are three things. First of all, why do you think that individuals and particularly Western consultants owe duties to other people and particularly people in these nations? Secondly, why do you think they are committing active harms that are not only in terms of preventing regime change but also in terms of active repression? And finally, why this will be effective in terms of destabilizing and bringing down these regimes? First of all, let's be very clear. By Western, we mean, Western uh, we mean consultants that come from any Western liberal democracy in which they have had the benefit of that democracy and that liberty. In terms of consultants, we mean like military consultants, we mean oil refining consultants, we mean any other consultants you can talk about. In terms of this level of sabotage that we want, we want to make it materially more difficult for that dictatorship to continue in its proper function, but Crucially, we want to caveat that we do not believe it should be in any way that leads to greater repression. So, for example, by purposely mistraining troops such that they commit war crimes. Like, we think that's fairly clear on our side of the house. So, firstly, why do they owe duties? Two reasons. First of all, because they have materially benefited from a system in which they are continuing to deny to other people. By bolstering a system of dictatorship, they prevent the, pro they prevent the proper functioning and the will of the people from coming out. In that circumstance, it is something that they have benefited from and something that they deny to other people. But secondly, because they prevent accountability and lead to increased repression because of their uh, ability to do so. So in turn, why is that? Why is it that they are committing harm? This functions in two ways. Firstly, directly, and secondly, indirectly. In terms of direct harm, it is very clear that the training by Eric Prince Blackwater of troops in Saudi Arabia, places like Saudi Arabia, is leading to the prevention of the will of the people from coming out. That means that people are literally dying because of what that man chooses to do. It means that the will of the people is not coming forward. It means that oil wealth can continually be diverted to other individuals who are not accountable because there is no capacity for that to happen. This would not be as effective were it not for the contribution of that individual. In that circumstance, he owes a moral duty in order to prevent that because he is materially contributing to that oppression and to that lack of accountability. I'll take care of you. Jack, you're assuming that in the absence of those black oil consultants, Nothing happened when those troops aren't effective. What's replaced it instead is more oppressive training by troops that are going to be that are going to be to more deadly repression in countries like Saudi Arabia. We're going to suggest on our side of the house that uh, the Saudi Arabian government chooses to chooses to use these people because they are the most effective way of getting reform. Otherwise, it would be a somewhat irrational investment in order to further the cause of liberty at the same time as training troops to kill your citizens. That was weird. So secondly, in terms of indirect harm, how do they contribute? Firstly, in terms of the economic continuance of the regime, they enable that regime to continue. So under the regime of Augusto Pinochet in Chile, uh, economists from the Chicago School were able to come in and train individuals in order to be able to produce economic benefits, which meant that there was no ability to hold that government to account because they did not have to seek the will of the people or seek accountability. They are able to continue well, their regime far, far better. No thanks. Equally, companies like Royal Dutch Shell in Nigeria, like US oil consultant, consultants in Saudi Arabia, are able to enable the regime to continue and oppression to continue in two ways. Firstly, because they are able to buy off elites who would otherwise demand accountability, elites like the military, elites like business leaders with vast oil wealth, which means that there is no demand amongst those uh, ski surrenders to bring about change, even though there is popular will. It is not enough to simply have the will of the people in order to be able to change a dictatorship, Mr. Speaker. You also require the consent of elites like the army at the point at which they can be more easily paid off. It means that the will of the people gets denied. Secondly, they're able to continue the proper functioning of those countries through things like contributions to the world oil supply, 
life, which means that countries like the United States essentially turn a blind eye to those, to those abuses. That means that we don't get the kind of pressure that is necessary in order to bring about real substantive change. In another way, they are very directly contributing to that oppression and contributing to that harm. Yeah. What do you imagine will happen when dictators in these countries notice that consultants are sabotaging? Um, like, I imagine that they will stop, firstly, they may stop employing consultants. In that sense, it makes it far, far less easy for them to be able to continue their repression because, like, otherwise they wouldn't employ them. Again, a benefit for our side of the house. Secondly, there is obviously going to be a time lag from when they notice that somebody is attempting to sabotage them. At that point, sabotage has already occurred and the running of the regime is materially more different. We don't suggest a blanket policy of law that says everybody has to do it. This is a moral duty that individuals have in order to try and prevent the proper functioning of these regimes. Why is it going to be effective? Two ways. Firstly, because as I have said, they are less able to repress their people because they don't have the training to effectively be able to do it. Secondly, because they are less able to buy off people. But thirdly, because they make the kind of information available that is capable of bringing about regime change. They are able to reveal the information to the public that is currently concealed from them by making it public. So when people go to organizations like WikiLeaks to reveal what the Chinese government are doing, that makes it far, far harder for that government to conceal things. It makes it far harder for individuals to go unaware of what is going on. But what's more, it wakes individuals who are currently mutter, uh, currently muttering on in the status quo from moral carelessness, right? It means that they see the kinds of abuses that their governments are, are carrying out but when their governments haven't expressed that to them. In that circumstance, you're able to create the kind of pressure amongst those who are liberally minded to bring about change. Again, in a very real sense, the presence of that kind of information enables people to bring about change, both within the regime and without, because Western governments are now able to formulate accurate policy initiatives to cater to the exact workings of those governments. Mr. Speaker, this is something that contributes to harm. We want to prevent it. This is going to be effective in destabilizing some of the worst regimes in the world. I am very proud to propose. Processes that's going to harm people as a result. 
They talk about this idea that also, through economic advice, you're safeguarding the government. What we say is it's not that you're not holding them accountable, yeah, we say quite the opposite. You inculcate norms of proper governance and it can be a moderating force on the government. Because consultants often emphasize things like efficiency, like actually doing what you aspire to do, rather than wasteful patronage systems. We think that having this influence, which we get only on our side of the house, is going to be beneficial um, for the governance of the country. Yeah. Then they talk about why preserving the state is bad, because they can buy off of elites. We think that there's still a place for sanctions from the international community to put pressure on this regime. That's a better mo model for change. But we also think that these norms of proper functioning make them less inclined for, it, for them to think that it makes sense to pay off elites and to govern properly. Then they make these arguments about why their success allows the U.S. to turn a blind eye. We don't think they've established a moral argument for why the economy of a country can be held hostage at the expense of the people simply because you believe it might yield benefits to regime change. You as an independent consultant are not fit to make that determination. They give you a list of reasons for why this is going to be affected. To whatever extent they can tell you that it might spur regime change, the problem is they have to sell you that the behavior of these dictators will be better absent outside forces. We don't think it means they're going to stop oppressing the people or pursue infrastructure pro projects. They're just going to do a shit job of it. They're going to rely on crap, or uh, not contractors, uneducated workforce, massive safety harms. Or in the case of the military, Michael's POI was, though we don't like what Blackwater does, why they may hire Blackwater is a more professional, properly trained, and disciplined military force. If you just have random, poorly equipped people running wild in the countryside, they can be far more dangerous than a trained Blackwater ever would be. Substantive matter. Why do we think there's not a positive moral professional obligation here? First, we say, when you sign a consulting or a, <laughs> or a law firm agreement, you don't promise to win the case. You don't promise to double profit. You don't assure that all your forecasts will be accurate because you're not in control of that. But what is damn sure enshrined in all client service is the promise of good faith efforts to preserve the interests of that client. If you eliminate that notion that good faith exists, then you violate the privity of contract that you voluntarily entered to to begin with. We think that this is problematic first because even though they say it's only an individual decision, other dictators will take notice. So insofar as the privity of contract has been violated in some instances, that's when we think dictators might not hire consultants and that would be bad, but they might do also bad things. What are these things? We think that there's not a positive moral obligation here because in most instances, like whether you have a duty to save someone who's drowning, those are instances where we say inaction is bad, but it's bad only insofar as you, could, you all you have to do is take reasonable steps that didn't violate some other law and didn't put you at great peril. So like if you couldn't swim, you wouldn't be expected to save someone who's drowning. The problem here is, one, you have a limited capacity to know how well your sabotage is going to impact that society. Secondly, you put yourself at massive risk if you sabotage the projects of a regime. I don't know if you heard of you. Dictators aren't the most understanding people in the world. So they're not going to be like, oh, that's all right, man, we'll get it next time. They might kill you. They might kill your family. They can harm you in any number of ways. Why is that OK? Well, then don't enter into a contract that makes the repression and killing the people easier. So what we say is, in that world where they're not getting or not hiring any services with Western companies, we don't think that they're necessarily going to collapse. They're just going to do their already crappy form of governance in a more dangerous fashion. Next, I want to talk about why this is harmful for the population. We've already told you why oil extraction and infrastructure is important. It, it enhances people's lives. There's spillover effects of wealth. It employs large swaths of the population. If your advice endangers these sorts of uh, efforts and other people are harmed as a result, they can caveat that out in their model. We think it's morally reprehensible to say that a failure to consult adequately could give rise to more accidents in oil refining and harm people within that country itself. We also think that it's important to be able to seek Western consultation because if you didn't do that, it's not that what these countries would be more beholden to is outside countries running their business within these borders, plundering them of their material mineral wealth, and taking all of that value outside of the country abroad.
abroad. We think that these dictators, while they may not be perfect, are functionally defending their country from plundering multinational corporations who are not going to derive or not going to provide any value to the population at large. And finally, as we've already laid out, interacting with people that get you to think about efficiency makes dictators less isolated and more moderate in the long run because they have more exposure to the international community, more exposure to businesses. We don't like dictators, but misleading and then changing extreme interest violates your duty as a professional, and it's not fair to use these people as hostages. We're proud to oppose. Incentivize people to innovate 
and produce more. At the point where you are innovating and producing more highly trained soldiers to suppress people, we think that's probably a poor idea, and the function for the uh, capitalist incentives has been cut. I'll take over. Providing humanitarian aid lessens um, the pressure on changing regime change. Are you against foreign aid on your side of the house? Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm in favour of not making reductive generalised statements about aid and targeting it where useful and not using it where it can be, you know, used by a regime in the same way that uh, using natural resources can be used to suppress its own people. Um, that's just not the case of humanitarian aid. Yes, it should be used effectively and poorly. So, what did we hear on the efficacy of this from home? Firstly, they said consultancies sometimes do some active good. Two reasons. Firstly, they do um, infrastructure, which has your um, exogenous benefits, you can get more money out. It doesn't really engage with the fact that Jack said that money is often used to build patronage networks which lock down powers to be front rise against them. And secondly, it's often divided on ethnic lines, um, which fuels um, warfare within certain areas in Africa where they have natural resources to be used. Secondly, then, they also said, look, the subtle influence. You can inculcate good governments into these poor regimes. Now, firstly, I don't think it's a normal interpretation of working with your clients when you, you know, inculcate them with things they don't really want you to. If McKinsey went in to influence Kmart to be you know, nicer to its workers, I think Kmart would be quite upset. At the point where he says, let's inculcate them, I think he's completely fine with us sabotaging what they actually want to achieve by bringing good companies. When he holds these ministers to account for the things that they owe them, well, that probably saying. just means he wants to join prop. Which, to be fair to him, I would too. <laughs> Secondly, though, he said, well, if we pull out completely, it would be worse for them. Um, well, firstly, that ignores all the things that Jack said, right? That, you know, at the point, they'll be less effective at doing this. That means they'll be less effective at you know, expressing their people and keeping resources to open them away from them. Secondly, there's a time lag, so there'll be a benefit while they're still there. Thirdly, you could be more subtle than that. You can just use the intelligence. So the intelligence services don't tend to give away you know, the best state secrets. They use them in an effective way, so they can still do in the future. I think it'd be quite daft to just say, hey, we're sabotaging you, you should get rid of this tomorrow. There are more effective ways to do that. Fourthly, um, it's necessary for me that um, they always, um, they wouldn't be cut off from having information because consultants aren't able to do the job without knowing who's in charge, what the resources are, and where they get allocated to, so you have them in the first place. Second, then, note that even if he's right, right, that these people leave and the state becomes less good, that a lot of their legitimacy in the nation comes from being affected. Pinochet in the 1970s could go to his group, the minority that kept him in control, and go, I am doing wonders for you and bringing you prosperity. At the point where they can't do that anymore, they are undermined as a power and easier to attack. Why is information good, in a sense? In Uganda, 80% of the budget was siphoned off. All the Minister for Education did when she came in was give posters to school telling them what they were owed. That single act meant that instead of 80% being siphoned, 80% of the budget arrived in schools. That was because people themselves knew what they were entitled to and knew who was meant to give it to them. Consultants are in the best place possible to leak that information without even being found out. Why? Because ask any first year consultant, most of what they do is look at HR flow diagrams of who's in control and in control of what. All they have to do is leak that away and people can empower themselves with access. Why is that particularly important? Because what they do is stop the ability to build up passive and shut down opposition. These dictators breed on fear and power built on influence, and these companies make it easier to do this. You break them down by taking away patches and networks and empowering people with information of what they're owed. I couldn't be prouder to stand in your position.
At the point where they just assert that these good benefits come from instability, I think they failed in their burden to show that your sabotage will necessarily lead to better moral outcomes. What I'm going to do in my speech and substantive today is talk a little bit about, about why we think that might not actually happen. But first, I want to do a little bit of rebuttal. Starting off with the issue of morality and the moral stance we're taking here. The first broad thing to say is lots of things help dictators stay in power. Dictators, people being happy, helps them stay in power. People are happy when they are fed, when they have health care, when they have roads and schools, and all other things that will tough and well defend all foreign aid. That seems to be the best and most lovely examples of foreign aid, which he presumably accept. Now, the reason why this matters is they never give you a reason to distinguish between the, uh, the aid you provide directly to the dictatorship itself or its government and the aid that you provide directly as, let's say, a nonprofit to the people. Both give support and legitimacy to the dictatorship because they make people happier. In fact, often when you are consulting for a dictatorship, what you are doing is advising a lower down part of the bureaucracy on how to build, let's say, an oil pipeline, a new factory, or some other form of economic development. There isn't a meaningful distinction here. But here's the other reason why I think they fail on the moral obligation argument. They ignored the two key caveats that Ferris gives you about when individuals don't have moral obligation. The first is when you can't assess with certainty what the effect of your, uh, the effect of your action is going to be. All they give you, if you believe their four-part asserted framework for when you have a moral obligation, is that you can foresee what will happen in the dictatorship and that you have the capability to have an influence on it. First, you never know that your sabotage is actually going to be effective, right? You don't know that the information will get out. You don't know that it will be discovered. You don't know that it will have any sort of lasting effect. But much more importantly, even if you know it has an effect in the short term, you have no way of knowing whether it will have long-term positive effects. The really good analysis that parents gives you that built on my maybe poorly worded POI uh, was the notion about contractors and Eric Prince. Now, I don't like that the Saudi Arabian military has is effective at repressing its people. I like, however, that it is probably trained to do so without needing to kill them. In other words, if you teach a military how to be professional, how to not have renegade soldiers who feel pressure to keep things in order and then start shooting when things go to shit, you actually save more people's lives. In that sense, I would rather have an Eric Prince-trained military than the opportunity cost of having a poorly trained military by some other oppressive regime in the Middle East that is going to teach them how to be more violent, more oppressive, and kill more people as a way of maintaining legitimacy, as opposed to appearing more professional as attaining legitimacy. I think they implicitly you can see in their moral framework, and I'll take you in a second, Jack, that you need to have positive moral outcomes. And with some degree of certainty, Varex gives you the example of saving someone who's about to be drowning, right? The only way you would say you ever have a positive moral obligation to do that is if you know that you can swim and you know that you'll be successful at the point where they risk worse moral outcomes by having worse people involved in these regimes, leading to worse harms. That's potentially immoral. Yeah. When Blackwater engaged with the Saudi military, because they are explicitly trying to prevent regime change and prevent the Arab Spring. Yep. They know that if they're there, it is more effective to prevent right, right. The, the they're, they're trying to prevent regime change. Guess what? The Saudi government, after Blackwater, wants to prevent regime change. What will it do? Turn to another form of person who's going to teach their military or come up with some practice to teach their military how to be effective at stopping people from revolting. What do people who aren't Blackwater know how to do in order to stop people from revolting? Shooting them. That's why you see pressure in mass killing of demonstrators in Syria and other countries in the Middle East. Next, I want to talk about capitalism and the capitalist incentives that we have here. So they talk about, uh, I already covered how if anything remotely related to foreign aid that is helpful for people, it's going to lead to negative incentive and essentially prop up dictatorships under their side of the house. But when, they, when we talk to them about inculcating standards of good government, they say, oh, well, it's not, we, it's immoral on our framework for consultants to violate the will and undermine the will of, uh, of, the, company, of the countries with whom they're working by, let's say, encouraging them to liberalize. We actually think the interests are quite well aligned here, right? A repressive Saudi Arabia and a free Saudi Arabia still has an interest in having oil pipelines. An oppressive Saudi Arabia and a free Saudi Arabia still has an interest in roads, schools, and other benefits to its people. At the point where consultants tell you how to do all of those things better, then when you eventually end up with freer states, however long it takes in the long run, they are better able to take care of their people on our side of the house. Finally, they talk about this kind of indirect harm and issues with, you know, supporting Pinochet in, um, issues with supporting Pinochet in Chile, and also with uh, this ridiculous example of posting uh, in Uganda about the actual money that schools are owed. I think what this highlights is the significant risk that you're, that you're taking 
the one here. They never really engage with Ferris's analysis about the risk that you would expose yourself to. And this is the last and most important of the moral points, right? You don't have a moral obligation to put yourself, your family, your life at risk. Yes, you may be good at hiding from these governments, but guess what these governments are really good at doing? Finding out people who have betrayed them and enacting revenge against them, whether it's against you, your company, or others, you can't have a personal moral obligation to take on that risk. No, thank you. Now I'm going to talk to you about the alternative world on their side. Because even if you believe all of their analysis about how uh, you're not going to have revenge enacted against you, you're not going to have, you, you are going to have some sort of successful uh, attempt at, at making a change by sabotaging these governments, I don't think they've ever shown that there's significant benefits that come from it. First, there's a chance that sabotage is just discovered early and dealt with, right? You tear down the posters in the Ugandan schools, it affects one fiscal year of funding, the government gets even more cautious, steals money, steals more money from schools next year goes back to the same old thing, except now you have a government that is more skeptical, more oppressive, and less willing to take risks with helping people if it sees that helping its people with consultants is what's going to endanger its legitimacy and farming. But let's assume that you actually get some sort of meaningful change. We think that if there's one thing to learn from the Arab Spring, it's that change needs to be organic. And first, if these governments can point to the fact that someone has been sabotaging them as the source of change, we think that secret legitimizes any subsequent democratic movement. Look at the fact that in Iran they still believe the UK is responsible for everything that happens there secretly. Skepticism and, and uh, fear of outside influence is pervasive in these repressive countries, and it can last for years. You weaken the ability of any democratic movement to get started, to make immediate long-term change by associating that democratic movement with renegade Western consultants that have said they are in a better position than the populace themselves to know how to bring about change and how to ultimately undermine this government. It's bad economics, it's bad on an individual level, and ultimately it's worst off these societies we beg to oppose.
like to thank the government member for her speech and call on the opposition member Hugh. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Um, what we think we've had in this debate is a government side that has assumed throughout that the only good that people in dictatorships care about is the extent to which their state is democratic. That uniquely among human beings, they don't care about the economic growth, the stability, and so on that consultants give. What we've also had is the claim that wasn't particularly well analysed, um, not to do the judgment for you, that because dictatorships are hiring these people, it must be the most efficient thing possible to perpetuate dictatorship in that country. Not that dictatorships might have some other interest that leads them to hire consultants that in the long run makes democracy more likely. Two points of extension. Firstly, democracy and transition. And while democracy may be slower on our side of the house, it is better in other ways. And secondly, other goods. Why do people care about them? How consultants provide, provide them? Most of my rebuttal will be integrated. A few things to be said in brief uh, response to this. They tell you, well, dictatorships have to show the people that they're providing long term growth for them. Well, yes, we think it might be a good idea for dictatorships to show the people that they're providing long term growth, and that they might provide long term growth for people in those countries. No, thank you. It's not just that, that like, oil wealth creates propaganda, it also creates schools and hospitals <laughs> and like, armies to defend yourself from foreign invasion and all the other various things that people who live lives rather than just existing in the Bay East just care about. They tell you, oh, well, if, if, if the armies are less good, then they're less good at oppressing. If the police are less good, they're less good at oppressing. Well, maybe they're also less good at defending the people, they're also less good at preventing total breakdown. They tell you, well, consultancies give, West, give these dictatorships legitimacy. Yeah, because like, management consultancies are seen as global arbiters of moral good. <laughs> what we would say is that, is that the regimes largely take credit themselves for the consultancy you've done anyway, as we several other bits of your analysis suggested. And finally, they tell you, well, in our side of the house, there's a certainty of oppression, which is just a possibility on our side and a breakdown. Well, yes, any, you know, any future prediction is just necessarily somewhat probabilistic. That doesn't mean that any harm that exists currently is necessarily worse than any possible harm that might come in the long term. We think it might want that we can have good reasons to expect this breakdown and instability. So, democracy and transition. Because what we tell you here is that at least conceptually possible that a dictatorship may have short-term interests that in the long term are also in the interest of democracy. And um, now that it's conceptually possible, let's prove that it's true yeah. on no, various no, grounds. No, thank you. Um, one, we think that in general, economic growth is good for democracy, right? Empirical evidence suggests, for instance, that democracy can't survive, no thank you, in the long term without a GDP per head of around $7,000. They tell you, oh, well, it's bad, because economic growth looks in proper capture to networks and it lets them do, um, give out money on ethnic lines. Quite the reverse, Mr. Speaker. Patronage networks survive in extremely poor countries because you can't generate economic activity yourself. You need to rely on the vagaries of the local government official. When you have development on the ground, when you can like, make money some other way, you need less to appeal to people at the head of patronage networks. Similarly, you need less to coalesce around your ethnic group because you, aren't, because you don't have the same sort of um, danger of economic destitution. What we tell you, broadly speaking, is that the reason why economic growth is good for democracy are ma reasons that are manifold. One, people have longer time horizons when they think that they, when they're, um, and are more willing to think of the future, when they know what their next meal is going to be. So they're more likely to take a broader interest in the political state of the country. No, thank you. Two, people can like afford TVs and afford to go into the country on rallies and this sort of thing and get involved with democracy. And what we tell you, secondly, in terms of why the, the activities of management consultants to increase oil wealth or whatever it is might be good for long-term democratization and transitions, is that the development of stable institutions is extremely important to whatever government takes the place of the dictatorship in the long run, in, in, a, a democratic one if it comes. Why is this? Uh, no, thank you. It's because, very simply, if you want, in a situation of transition between one regime to another, if you want people to have to buy into the new state, it needs to be able to provide for people. And in particular, it needs to be able to provide basic goods like stability that need to happen in order for an, in order for an election to take place, right? So we look, for example, to the poor state of the Kenyan, um, of the Kenyan armed forces in 2007, who saw militias um, to fight against each other in those elections, no thank you led to wide-scale de um, destruction and the fatal undermining of that democracy. We think that's a problem. Insofar as the police forces can be made more efficient and, work, and made to work better by management consultants or whatever kind of consultants, we think that's useful if a democratic transition takes place. In their world, the worse they are, the more likely it is that they get breakdown. No. Thirdly, what we tell you is that 
is that in general, having a stable um, country is important to like, the, the success of, of uh, democracy or of people in, in general. Look, for example, to Liberia, where um, after the, uh, the absence of executive action, it's admittedly not a very nice company, um, there we saw wide scale civil war between various factions. We aren't sure that the cause of democracy or people coming together or whatever was was kind of, was Go. This is why democracy needs stability. The point is when dictatorships are able to deliver economic benefits to their elites, they're able to use that as a smokescreen to repress other people, and that's what leads to human rights. No, it's not why democracy needs stability. Guys, I don't know what It's not why democracy needs stability. Rather, it's why democracy needs to be coming into place in situations where the state is already stable, and in particular where the institutions are already well grounded. Because otherwise they can't get by an either transition. No. And finally, what we tell you is that when people do find out whether suddenly and on specifically the sabotage takes place, if when the data occurs, other people finding out um, about the sabotage, there are various problems. One, we think that dictators are likely to kick out all Westerners from their country. Look at Omar, Omar al Bashir, for example, in Sudan, who kicked out um, all aid workers after, after the ICC issued an arrest warrant against him. No, thank you. And secondly, because it creates serious and most of it. So finally, why are there other goods that these people, uh, that people in dictators are likely to value? There is. First of all, I tell you is that people do care about things other than whether or not they can cast their votes in a way. Having, like, being alive, being able to pay for food for yourself and so on, is an important, like, gateway right to the access to all the goods and choices that you might want to take advantage of in your life. Why are consumers important to this? Firstly, because if they do an efficient job and bring back growth, you're more likely to have those goods for you because your country is richer. Secondly, because consultants uniquely in these sorts of countries are able to speak truth to power, right? Incidentally, oppression may not always be the most efficient way to run a country. It may turn people against each other. It may mean that people who would do a good job are excluded from state services. Consultants who don't have the same kind of fear of like not having any other opportunity if they lose this one client can tell the state this and say, listen, stop doing this. It's not actually helping you. You don't get that opportunity when the only government discourse that takes place is internal to that state. It's the government, is the, you know, is the dictatorship speaking with their cronies. And finally, what we tell you is that in terms of signaling to investors around the world in this country is somewhere that you can do business, the client list that consultancies have are extremely important. They can talk to their other clients be able to be able to combine things like healthcare or jobs between these countries and tell them this is somewhere that is stable and that we can work. That's really important. So Mr. Speaker, for a host of reasons, I'm very proud to stand up. Uh, for, for everything they said to be true, it's just patently not. What we need is revolution in order to 
that are for democracies. We think this helps um, in, in, in like ways I don't know what. Firstly, I want to talk then about moral duties. Um, so we think that like we've heard three things from opposition. So firstly, like you only have moral duties when um, when like things are knowable. So when the consequences are knowable, you've heard that we only have moral duties. Um, like um, and that, that like what, that an individual can't have moral duties over a country. And thirdly, like you don't have a duty yeah, where it harms yourself. Um, but firstly, you don't. Yeah, the point is that stable development is a necessary condition of democracy. It's not necessarily sufficient, but how do you get it through decentralization? So, like, obviously, we'll come on to that later. Flagged is one of my points. Um, but if you want to talk about this now, like, we think that we think like because of everything I've said, it's the only way like this condition can come about. So, because this condition can never come about under your law, so like it has to come about under our law. So when like so so when you said like it is necessary because you need to buy things like voting booths. This is just necessarily facetious, given that like, given that this democracy, this, this dictatorship is just never going to give that to you. Like they're never going to allow that to happen. They're specifically in control. Everything you said is wrong. Yes. Um, so moral duties. Um, like opposition has given us three reasons like why you might have moral duties, and we think that they're like firstly they're kind of like, assertive and weird, and secondly still not relevant within the situation. Um, so like as Amanda tells you, the noble stuff is weird, um, because like. We know, and secondly, like the, the, the future is the future, right? Like the consequences of any action are unknown. Um, secondly, they said that like um, this individual can't have more duties over the country. Um, like we, we think that like when you're specifically positioned, like when you're specifically positioned, when you specifically have that power, then like we don't see why scale should matter. I and mean, then thirdly, like you don't have a duty to put yourself in power. I'm going to talk about that. So what first prop do um, is like they give us some like slightly cleverer um, uh, reasons why you might have moral duties. Um, so the first one is that they show that you specifically gain from this moral duty. So you specifically benefit um, for, for, uh, not moral duty, you specifically gain from this bad act. So you specifically have um, like lots of stuff from this bad act. And we think that like that does inculcate. Um, and then secondly, like you have this moral duty because to not act in this way would help that dictatorship. Um, like you, like without them, uh, without you, they fail. And um, we think this gives you an extra duty. <coughs> what Amanda shows in terms of moral duties are two things. The first one is. So she says that if you don't do this contract, someone else will. So if you don't specifically do this and you do what first of all, and you say like, no, I'm not going to sign this contract, someone else can have it because lying is bad and sabotage is bad. Then what you do is you, you put that, like, you put someone else in a position where they can help can them, you also cause this harm. You also cause this harm within the situation. So by negating this responsibility, you do the same as were you to have done it anyway. Um, so we think that this is like really, really bad, and um, we think that like because you're in a specific, like you're in a specific situation where you can have a duty. Secondly, like, um, like Amanda tells us that the other reason that you have this moral duty um, is because you're like in a very unique position. So you are not like some poor, starving person, um, like in, in horrendous country X, who doesn't have that voice, um, who doesn't have that ability, who doesn't have any economic power, who doesn't have any way to success. Who doesn't like, who doesn't even have like, uh, I don't know, some, some stuff to make banners out of. We think that because you like, because because this person in this country not only does not have all of those things that you might affect him, but also is specifically at risk. So if you are a person living in Saudi and you stand up and, and, and you protest, we think that you're specifically in harm's way. So we think that when you're a contractor, you're not in harm's way. Like you're free from, uh, free from all of the threats, you're free from all of the danger that could come. We think that because you have the power to make such change, free from all of that danger, um, then you're in a unique position, and that, that also like gives you more of a duty to make. So breaking dictatorships. So as Amanda tells you, dictators are shrouded in her in rhetoric. <coughs> what we do, um, aside from all of the lovely things that first popped us, um, is that we like we 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 help this in two ways. Firstly by changing the minds of elite, um, and secondly by like giving the evidence that international community needs to it. Um so like so we see that lots of people in dictatorships help prop up that dictatorship. 
They need it to be from a reliable source, like even if they don't give their sense away, you think you need that. For example, like when Gaddafi stands up and he says that he's better than any alternative, if we can show how, like, how bad his regime is, then, then, like, then the international community can act. Um, so, like, why is this? Like, firstly, one of the reasons um, I, I've talked about in rebuttal. Um, so, like, when, 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 when I'm saying like, schools and hospitals are also lovely, we say like, firstly, democracies can also provide schools and hospitals, um, and we think that they're necessarily going to be better because democracies spread wealth. Like, democracies don't just contain wealth in the elites, they give them and disseminate them to everyone. We think that this means that, like, even if there is a bad revolution to start with, like, happiness ensues in the end. That's what we're making. Political 
rights. Moreover, we can tell that the response which shows that he is more efficient forms of repression, repression doesn't necessarily apply to all dictatorships. Countries like Jordan or Singapore at certain points in history, they would have been comparatively benevolent, non-repressive dictatorships. What do we bring you on the question of economic gains? Because so firstly, open opposition point out that there are like technical benefits to uh, to bring consultants into these kind of contexts that make businesses and states function better. What Hugh adds to that is firstly that consultancy is some kind of signaling function for other forms of Western investment, and secondly, they're able to speak the truth to power. I'll take topic in one second. What are the end responses to this? Why is economic growth bad? Firstly, it apparently allows you to buy people off. Firstly, as Hugh points out, that kind of concedes the point that this must trickle down. If your claim is that people need to give their people like citizens goods in order to make these things effective, then they do actually have to be effective. So when economic growth allows you to stay with buy off elites, hide information from the domestic and international public, and kill Okay, okay. In response to this stuff about Patrick, tough and shut up. In response to this stuff about Patrick and Jeff Rose. Firstly, patronage potentially goes a long way down, right? That's because your justification for this is that you need to prevent a revolution using these economic benefits. That requires you not to have a critical mass of people in society who might be poor enough to be willing to revolt. Secondly, as you brought you, patronage goes down when you get economic growth. The response which goes, oh, well, like, this is ed- like maybe distributed on ethnic lines, it's totally non comparative. Yeah. Democracies, they will also distribute things along ethnic lines. It's never clear when that was worse <laughs> under dictatorship. So, secondly, transitions and what happens. The first thing I want to point out is that, like, we think all along the Gulf Edge, they've missed what we brought you out of extension, which is it may not just be about getting a revolution, but rather the quality of democracy that accrues after that, and whether or not the conditions are in place for a relatively stable,